Hi, how's everyone doing? So, as they said, I'm, I'm Carlos, I work at GitHub, and today we're going to go on a tour of some of the edge cases and unusual situations that happen when you provide uh, Git hosting to the world at large. So, you know, you've probably heard of GitHub, we're the largest Git host um, in the world. We, are, we have over 50 million repositories, 19 million users, and with this kind of numbers, we run into situations where we just didn't predict any of, the, of what was going to happen. Um, I work in the Git infrastructure team. Uh, our team is responsible for providing Git as a service to both internal customers, that's the website and the API, and to external users, that's all of you running your Git clients. We also handle support escalation for the technical aspects. If a user writes in asking about performance issues with the repositories or support needs, some, you know, some if they want some input on the technical aspects of, of some response they're going to send, they'll, they'll ask us to, to double check their work. So as I said, you know, as a popular website, we, we run into a fair share of unexpected use cases. And even if it's not obvious at the first glance that something um, is going to cause, cause some issues, there can be un unexpected interactions with how we run our infrastructure or how other people run theirs. Um, first of all, I'm going to name a few repositories in this talk. These are not the only repositories where we had to intervene, and, or the only ones that are, even that are behaving unexpectedly. Uh, most of them aren't even doing anything that's that, that, that we would consider inappropriate. We just didn't plan for them to be doing what they were doing. And so there's a couple of ways of resolving the issue. Some of them, the, issue, the, the solution is just technical, either on our side or theirs. Sometimes it's just uh, teaching the, um, the user about some of the limitations that Git has and how to work around them. So with that, let's start with our own repository. So it's called GitHub GitHub. Um, and you know, we, um, we deploy to something like 400, 500 machines on every single deploy. And we deploy about 100 times a day. And this is a, something we're very proud of, and this is something we want to keep doing. And in order to enable that, uh, we need to keep that um, running smoothly. All of the, these 500 machines all ask for, the, um, for an update at the same time, and that needs to be quick. This is a, a big load on all of these servers running, um, hosting the GitHub repository because it's only one of them where they serve out of and 500 asking at the same time. This is what we call a uh, thundering head problem. And we, we can use the fact that the, all of these repositories update at the, uh, at the same time they start from the, the last deployed commit, obviously, and then they want to run to the same commit. So all, they need all the same data to be sent. This is an easy caching problem. When we detect um, that multiple identical requests are coming in from multiple hosts, we cache that response, and for a few minutes, anybody who asks for exactly the same thing, we can stream directly out of disk. And then you know, we don't even need to worry about Git and any of the calculations you would have to do. So we have um, the Kubernetes repo, K8. Nobody seems to be sure how to pronounce the, the name. Um, they make extensive use of pull requests, and this is a good thing, it's a very good thing. Uh, but it does put some extra load on our, on our machines. So when, when you have a pull request page open and the base branch updates, you might have noticed that uh, the button goes gray for a bit, and then it, it hopefully com comes back green. Uh, what's happening there is the, the web page is asking the server, hey, can I make the button green? So this involves creating a merge and a rebase on our servers and then storing the results. To store the results, um, we need to update, uh, we need to store the, this as references because that's how, how Git thinks um, of, um, how, how Git knows where, where things are. Um, unfortunately, we're a bit limited on updating a couple of, to a couple of times a second, uh, which is where, where the bottleneck comes in. When 50 people have 100 re uh, pull requests open all at the same time, and they all say, hey, can, you, can I merge this? Um, we essentially time out 
a lot of them. So we, we start mitigating this by grouping up all of these references, so we limit the pull request updates to a single update doing multiple reference updates. And then the, the bigger lesson here is we just, it's okay to be too slow and time out in these cases because it's, it's a machine doing re the request, and when we time out and say, sorry, I couldn't do this in time, it will just ask again, and then eventually the, um, it won't time out, it'll, it'll be fine. The, the user will see the, the correct result. The, this next repository is a bit of an interesting one. Uh, it's called Commit Wars, Commit Wars. Uh, a user wrote in to ask uh, whether it would be okay to have a raffle in their hackathon. The idea they had was to have the 300 plus people they had at their hackathon push to a single repository at the same time, and the winner would be the last person who pushed before a particular time. Um, we asked them not to do it, and we, we told them, that, <laughs> right? We, we, we told them why we didn't think it would work, both, you know, you can fake a git timestamps, um, we're not gonna be able to handle 300 people pushing at the same time to the same repository, and you're gonna run into quota usage. They went ahead and did it anyway. I um, think they changed that tiny aspect, but it, it was basically the same thing. They tried to perform 7,000 pushes in the space of an hour, all to the same reference, in the same repository. Um, the repository just couldn't keep up with the load. So this is our error graph. That's <laughs> that red bar right at the bottom, which you barely can see, that's the, um, that's the threshold that makes us get alerted, because that's, <laughs> that's above the, the usual baseline of errors, because we are not of computers, you know, not everything goes well. Um, yeah, that was a fun night. Um, <laughs> but at least, so we took solace in the, the, um, the fact that the, the, their attempt failed in the ways that we predicted. And it didn't affect any of the other repositories. Um, and this gives us a lot of confidence in, in our autonomous systems and our understanding of them. Right? It feels very good to know that you know, we said, yeah, it's going to fail in this way, and it failed that way. That lets us sleep at night, knowing that it's going to get handled. So the next one's not you know, so unreasonable. They have a, it's open data about New York. I'm not entirely sure what they're, what they're doing, but the thing here is that they have um, 800, you know, almost a million files in their repository, and that's for, for a, the tip commit has this. It's well sharded, they have lots of nested uh, repositories, so for maintenance, the objects are to be, for maintenance it's basically fine, but they're running to us and saying, hey, we're trying to do a, an update of the readme file via the API, it's we're changing one line on the top level, and the, the API call is timing out, like what's happening. And it turns out, I mean, this was entirely on us. The, we were doing something that usually works, which is the equivalent of what you would be doing locally. We're reading all of the files, um, update the one, the one file with the new content, and then write everything back out and create the new commit with that. This usually works. Um, when, when you see it with, this, um, with these numbers, it does seem a bit silly. Um, but so we noticed there's only six files and two directories at the top level, and really that's all we would need to do. That's, uh, that's all that we would need to change, right? The top level is, is a single change, 20 bytes of, of a, that, that needs to change there. So we realized, hey, maybe more people are doing this kind of thing. So you know, we made the code a bit um, a bit smarter, so that it would avoid um, reading in any 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 directories you would need to read in. So that's what happened. That's the, the arrow is when, when I deployed the change to the first few repositories, and then it drops a bit further uh, when it was activated for every, everyone. Um, that's the 90th percentile for, for this particular operation. And I mean, I can certainly say that finding out this, this issue with this edge case repository was better for everyone. Like, our load is lower, our users get faster access to everything. Um, <laughs> So this is this repository, I think it's Gambutsi. Um, I found it as the largest one in one of our drives, and so I went like, well, what's happening here? Like, how do they use up all of this space? 
So in case you don't know, so 9GAG is this website people pull, let's call them funny images and videos. At one point, as far as I can tell, at one point they replaced their feed, RSS feed, um, with an app for your phone, uh, and they would show you ads on there. Uh, people were unhappy, so they set up their own replacement feeds. This was such a replacement feed. Um, there was the XML file with, um, you know, for the feed, but then also all of the images. So they were pushing about three to 400 megabytes every 10 minutes. Um, we noticed this, and you know, we, we told them, please don't do this. Uh, so, and, you know, and they stopped doing it, right? Sometimes you just have to ask. Um, I think they're still pushing the XML file, but they're hosting the images elsewhere. Um, this next one you might have heard of, CocoaPods specs, if you read Hacker News or whatever. So they managed to hit a few different limits uh, that made, um, all at the same time, that made hosting them really hard. So a bit of background, CocoaPods is a uh, package manager for Objective-C and Swift programming languages. Uh, this repository is its manifest. This is how it knows what, what packages exist. It has a lot of files, a lot of commits. Um, I believe they push about 1,000 commits per week automatically. Um, and until very recently, they had very large directories. All of their packages were all listed alongside. So it was maybe 80,000 directories next to each other. Um, I mean, you, you, you probably wouldn't want to check that out. On our servers, that's the same. We still have to read huge, huge trees. These, we keep seeing issues here with, uh, so on the website we show you the, here, he, this is the last time someone touched this directory, someone, or here's the last modified file, uh, time of all of these files. Th that keeps timing out because we just cannot get far back enough in, in history in the 10 seconds we give ourselves to actually provide any information here. Um, to add to that, every Coco, CocoaPods user was updating maybe multiple times a day, right? When you're saying, oh, I wonder if there's an update for, my, for this library. And then everyone's hitting us. They were, uh, they were un, in a way that was very efficient. We couldn't cache a lot of the responses. So there was an issue that the, the, some user opened on their main repository saying, hey, things are a bit slow, like what's happening? And then, so this is the issue. You can see our response saying, well, this is why it's very hard for us to host this. Um, in, in, in a sense, they, there were so many clients, there were so, many, so much load, that our Git monitoring system would say, this is too much, I'm going to throttle you. So we would add in delays before even processing anyone's command. This, was, this is to protect the, the other uses of the, of the machine. Because you know, if, if everyone is fetching CocoaPods and your repository lives on the same machine, you wouldn't want to you wouldn't want us to delay your repository because they're you know they have a lot of users. So this was interfering with their with their users enough that we decided to spread the load. So we moved to we generally serve a repository from a particular repository, but we have the ability to spread it up to three computers right now. So we did this. Uh, this also spreads out the quotas because the, the load needs machine is, is lower. We did also apply stricter limits on the, um, on, on the history we'll show on the UI, so instead of just trying out all of the 10 seconds, we'll, we give it much lower um, timeouts because we expect that most of the time we're not going to find the data we need in, in time. And this, this lets, lets us spend more time serving requests that are going to be successful. So, you know, we asked them to, to do the, their updates more effective, more efficiently, so it was easier on our machines, and to use more, uh, to use more nested directories, which, make, which makes the, the, key, the key objects smaller. And this is then quicker for everyone. We have less load on our machines. Their own clients update faster. Um, right, so let's... Let's move to this one. This is the Barry Clark Jekyll now. This, this lets you very easily um, uh, get started with having a, a Jekyll site, so you can have it on GitHub pages. 
you fork the you fork this repository, give it the name of your username, and then you know GitHub will host the pages there. Uh, this has, however, been that every fork of this of this repository is someone else's website, so it's completely different content, right? There's, there's the common history up to the point you fork, but then everything else is is different. This is the opposite assumption that we have everywhere else on the website. And this makes the, the clones more expensive than most. It's not, it's not that bad. Uh, I mean, we, we, we do have uh, ways of making this faster. But um, then there was a time when some group of servers decided, hey, I know, I'll, I'll, I'll clone every single fork of this repository at the same time. As I mentioned, we serve them all, of, all out of a single machine. So it got a bit busy. Uh, load, that's a uh, load average 400 on a 34 core machine. This was never going to succeed. It was just going to be annoying. We had to move, uh, you know, it does, the, the system does it automatically, but load had to move away from that machine. We, the solution here is to ban the IPs and kill the processes and the machine is happy again and it can continue serving uh, just normal users, shall we say. Um, this minute CI logs, we were suspicious of this one um, because it has CI logs in the title. Um, <laughs> So it's, it's not in my list here, but there's, a f there's, there's some people who essentially use us as, hey, something happened on one of my machines, I'm going to push an update to GitHub. And that gets, that, uh, that gets inefficient very quickly. Uh, so, um, but what happened here is we were alerted about this repository getting some errors, and you know, so you know, we look into this and say, hey, there's multiple pushes a minute for the last few days. Uh, what's happening here, right? We can, we can handle this write load for a while, but eventually we need to run maintenance on the, uh, on the repositories because every push is a new pack file, that's a new file, that's a new place to look for things. And every time you push, it becomes slower and slower and slower. And we have, you know, we, we calculate, okay, how many pushes have there been since uh, the last time we ran maintenance, and then, you know, the top however many, we run maintenance on them. It's, but this, they were pushing so quickly that by the time we were done with maintenance, there were already enough new data files that we had to run maintenance again and again and again. But um, to, to add to this, one of the machines that's hosting this repository fell behind and it, it just couldn't catch up. So, I mean, this certainly seemed like something weird was going on. Um, this was an academic IP range, so we figured some student was being careless or had a script running for, for a class that they, you know, they didn't realize. So we, we asked the, the owner of the repository, hey, well, you know, what's happening? And they said, oh, yeah, we had this, um, this experiment running, but we turned it off six days ago. Like, you know, if we do it again, we'll, we'll make sure to, to be nicer. We're like, no, no, like right now, there's, you have been pushing for the last six days straight. Uh, so, you know, can you double check, like, you know, just, just to make sure nothing, nothing fishy is going on? So, sure enough, they found some processes. What they were doing was essentially they were pushing and then for, uh, creating a new process, which was also pushing, was also creating a new process, was pushing. And this just sped up to the point where, you know, after six days, we couldn't keep up with the load anymore. Um, it has since been deleted. I don't know what, what came out of their experiment. Um, hope, hopefully, you know, more double checking that you know, things aren't running. So this, is in a, uh, uh, this next example is in a particular repository. It's more, so we make forking easy. That's you know, the, the way to contribute. Some people fork to, just to have their own copy. Um, this gets into a bit of the, the, the bookkeeping that we need to run internally to make the, the forks cheaper than, than the other ones would be. So for example, Torvas Linux, uh, it's about a gigabyte if you clone it. Uh, there's about 16,000 forks. Now, we don't spend 16 terabytes on this because we'd run out of disk space very quickly if we, if we did this for every single repository. I mean, right, so 
what we do is we keep all of the objects together in the, in the same repository, and then we keep the, um, each fork is mostly contains um, information about what's this, what the, its references are, and then I'll, I'll link to here. My, my data is actually here in this other place. And this means that, you know, instead of 16 terabytes, the Trovas Linux is 42 gigabytes. This is still sometimes an issue with maintenance, that the automated maintenance tries to run, and then sometimes it times out, and then, you know, we, we add it to the list, said, hey, I, this failed, maybe a human should look at it. And so usually we can just say, well, try again, and it succeeds because it tried to run maintenance at a busy time of day, or it, it just wasn't working. Um, the, the thing about the, the next one, IntelliJ, is it's, it's a bit interesting because the, the clone size is bigger, but it has another magnitude fewer forks, yet it's bigger on disk. Uh, the thing here is they, they really like tags, which, which is good, right? It's good to know where, you know, this is the state at this point. But it does mean that we, when we fork, we copy over all of the tags. And then we keep a global list of all of the references in all of the forks of our repository. For um, IntelliJ, that references file is five gigabytes. Uh, and Git wants to read that multiple times whenever we run maintenance. Um, this is just because, you know, Git, uh, the, the repository, the Linux repository, you know, for which Git was originally intended, it has 500 tags, that's their use case. It was fine, so Git's not, you know, exactly efficient about doing these things. And <laughs> recently, it even became impossible to, fork, to create a new fork of the IntelliJ community repository because we would run out of memory for Git. Uh, not, not in the machine as a whole, but we do uh, limit each Git, each Git process to a certain amount of RAM so that it doesn't crash anything else. Uh, this, it, it, you can fork again now. Um, we, in, we made this a bit more efficient, but it's, it, it's, it's never done. The, uh, the inter and there's an interesting one with spoon knife where it's 160 kil kilobytes, right? It's, this is, this is a one we use for, for trainings, for workshops, where we tell people, Here's how you create a fork, here's how you create a pull request, this is how you collaborate with other people on GitHub. Um, it's, you know, therefore it has a lot of forks. It is nearly nine years of workshops and trainings. So it is, it's not only nine gigabytes, but this is partly more a, an issue for the people who run the database, uh, because that's where we store all the, the pull requests. This is over 5,000 pull requests that are open right now. Um, and I only know this over 5,000 because we stopped counting there. Um, this, is, this is a challenging problem, keeping all of this um, efficient, because if you only say, well, I want the cumulative uh, repository to be efficient, then you're making each individual clone less efficient. Uh, when we originally implemented some of these uh, uh, techniques that should have been more efficient, it actually turned out to be less efficient, we, we spend more time trying to recalculate what data to send you. Um, this is then, I mean, this has been fixed, we, it is now, we, we can now start cloning immediately, and in general, that's, unless you're you know, cloning everything in a single uh, network, it's fine, uh, we don't really notice clones that much. Um, it's really more forking and just running maintenance. The, the thing here is, you know, always, optim always be optimizing. This is a work that's never done. Uh, there, are, there are plenty of small optimizations that were driven by these repositories growing a bit more, and then they grow a bit more, and then we hit another issue, and then we fix that, and then, or, you know, or j just buy us a few months. And then, you know, it grows a bit more, and then it hits a different limit, and then we fix that. And um, this is work that's just never, never, never done. This last one was an, an, an interesting one. Um, th there's Enki is a website where you share, uh, you learn about like programming things, like you can learn about Git and GitHub, or just how to administer your machine, how to get started with developing. They, they, there's a companion app to 
make sure you commit to learning where you can store your, um, you can say, oh, today I did this, I learned about you know, how to do a git push, for example, or all this kind of stuff. Uh, however, they, this app made it so that they all pushed into the same repository every, uh, uh, all the time, so that it would ask, ask these particular users, so they would show up in their GitHub contrib uh, contributor graph. Um, I mean, yes, yeah, so some of the number, like 345,000 files, 150,000 comments, by themselves isn't all that much, but what really gave us pause is we noticed there's 26,000 individual contributors to this repository. Like, the, uh, the web page doesn't, sh the web page, if you look at contributors, it will show you the top 100, and we just don't even try to count more, because it's just not, it's barely worth it. Uh, this is a case where maintenance was still failing. They were pushing so often, and they had huge trees, similar to the, case, to the issue with CocoaPods, where they had every user, they had um, like the repository, then username, and then a timestamp because it was logging. And then every username was next to each other, so this gives us again the problem where I have 26,000 uh, directories in, in my tree, which is a huge tree that gets written over and over and over that it, it makes life very hard for Git. So we, we figured this wasn't a, a reasonable thing to do. So again, we asked, please don't do this. And they said, OK, fine, we won't. And then they wrote a blog post about how they broke, broke GitHub or something like that, which, I mean, it's fine. They, I mean, it's, they, they broke their own repository. Um, they broke our assumptions as well. Uh, right, so just to, to, to sum up, like, your users are gonna surprise you, and, and that's okay, that's great, right? The, the, you and your users grow up together, and within reason, the job is to make it work. Um, sometimes it is just nice to just reach out to your users and say, hey, why are you doing this? Like, could you be doing this a bit differently, or could you just not be doing it at all uh, in the more extreme cases? And just there's always something new. Every day is different, and you're always learning stuff. When you when when you let everyone give you data, they'll they'll give you all the data they have. Uh, thank you. Um, around.